Mongus is the podcast produced by Hmong American Media located in Sacramento, California and sponsored by Hmong Organizing for Progress and Empowerment Center, known as the Hope Center, along with Culture Through Cloth. I am your host, Sean. And I'm your host, Pachia. And we are Mongus. Mongus is a podcast where Pachia and I share our thoughts on anything and all things Hmong. Diving into our own experiences of what it means to be Hmong American and Hmong in today's times. What are we discussing today? So today we're going to be talking about a heavy topic, and that is murder-suicide. Uh, murder-suicide is something that has been impacting the Hmong community um, for a long time. I mean, it's just something that happens all the time throughout the U.S. Um, and the world, unfortunately. And so today we'll be talking about what murder-suicide is. Um, we're also going to be talking more about how it's taken place in the community, some of the cases, um, and then dive a little bit more into the issues that it brings up um, and kind of try to provide some resources if we can. Murder-suicide is defined as an act in which an individual will kill one or more people before killing themselves and committing suicide. And so... Um, a lot of times, uh, this is also uh, called um, familicide. Um, so a familicide is a type of murder or a murder-suicide in which at least one spouse or one or more children are killed or in which a parent or parents and possibly other relatives such as siblings or grandparents are killed. And so in some cases, all of the family members' lives are taken. If only one of the parents are killed, it will be referred to as a parricide, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and when all members of a family are killed, including when the killing takes the form of a murder-suicide, then the crime can even be referred to as a family annihilation. So there are a lot of these studies that have taken place. Um, there are a variety of studies, actually, that have taken place about why murder-suicide takes place or what uh, really um, sort of what are the catalysts that lead to murder-suicide. There are a variety of cases or a variety of studies. Some studies, you know, they do like 500 cases. Some studies they'll do like 900 cases. But in one of the studies that I looked up, 91% of perpetrators of murder-suicide are men. 88% uh -huh. use a gun and 70% involve some type of intimate partner violence. When we do talk about murder-suicide in the community, I know there have been conversations that have happened. These are the reasons why these topics come up too, like the topic of gun violence, the topic of uh, violence against women from men. Um, and so moving further into some of the research that I did, um, there was an article called Men Who Murder Their Families, what the research tells us. Um, and in that article, it quotes, the most common type of killer was a possessively jealous type of killer. And uh, the social and demographic factors that are related to all forms of family violence, um, not just murder-suicide, include poverty, unemployment, along with family stressors, such as disagreements over money or even sex or children. And so the economy plays a distal factor, um, which gets translated into family relations through poverty or employment or self-image and stressors. And so again, uh, these are the types of factors that play into all forms of family violence, but more specifically when it comes to murder-suicide, there's this idea of anomic suicide, right? So anomic suicide means like a type of suicide that stems from sudden and unexpected changes in your life situation. So for example, if you are suffering like suddenly from extreme financial loss. Um, so the disappointment or the stresses that may drive you towards committing suicide as a means of escaping um, a really sudden and unexpected change in your life that you can't deal with. Um, so that's what anomic suicide is. And then over enmeshment, um, which is a condition in which perpetrators will either view their family members as possessions, um, their family members, such as their wives or their children, as possessions. And so because of this, then um, 
they, you know, they don't see any boundaries between their identity and their children and their wives' identities. And so if they are prompted to commit an anomic suicide, then they're going to take, there's this over enmeshment they feel, then they're going to take their family with them. Wow. I think yeah. there's a lot of over enmeshment in the Hmong community to a so, certain point. So when I was doing this research, a lot of things just clicked, right? Like there are a lot of these types of issues we can see in the Hmong community in the ways that family dynamics sometimes are set up. And played out, yeah. Um, a lot of us live in poverty. A lot of us live in poverty. Yeah. We all come from poverty. poverty. Mm-hmm. Even if we're not living in poverty, it's yeah. a generational. Yeah, we're generation. only first gen, second mm-hmm. gen Americans who poverty came is a generational from, thing. Yes. You know, a recent case uh, in Minnesota involving a Hmong family was very tragic. Um, There's a family of five. Uh, the husband committed suicide, and um, you know the mother took the three children and left. The family they called the police for a welfare check, tracking her phone. They found the phone at a lake. And it's very tragic because now they pulled four bodies from the lake, uh, the mother in apparent suicide, and the other three bodies is being investigated now as a triple homicide. Yeah, so that case was really tragic, and I still remember when all of that was happening. So that was really recent. It just took place um, this past summer in July, um, and it, the... Mom's name was Molly, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, it was really sad because while this was all happening, I remember it, that morning the father had committed suicide um, and his sister or the, some of the relatives had actually gone on Facebook live. Right? live. Was a live video. Okay. And so that's how I learned about it before I saw any type of... Um, news article about it um and that in itself was already super sad and tragic and then later on that day like the mom and the kids had gone missing um and again all of this was being streamed on facebook so it was something that had really hit the community hard um because we were kind of following along um and I know that everyone was like extremely, just extremely um, upset and sad um, when the rest of the family were found in the lake. Yeah, this is a very, very tragic case. And, you know, what what can we take away from this case? It's just that, you know, there, there are support systems out there. You know, you could reach out to the national hotline, any local hotlines. You know, I think a lot of folks, we just got to realize that, you know, life doesn't end if you're having an altercation with your significant other, maybe, you know, there's there's other options that you can take out there. And maybe in a moment of weakness, you may do something irrational, but please don't. That's just one of the most recent cases, but murder-suicide in this way affecting, like, all the family members have been taking place. And so the reason why we wanted to talk about murder-suicide is because it's so rampant. Yes. This just happened in Minnesota, but, you know, just a few years ago, yeah. there was, like, two that happened back-to-back here in Sacramento, where we mm-hmm. are. Um, and then, you know, I remember, like, when that was happening, you had actually put out a post on um, the the Hope Center's Facebook page with all of these just like so I don't even know hundreds of names was it like hundreds it felt like hundreds of names of women that have been murdered by their husbands um throughout the U.S. since we've arrived here I remember one of the earliest cases was actually in 1989 so this has been going on for for years could you like talk more about that yeah case? so so you know as a lot of things was this was a big issue three four years ago you know because as you know among millennials become more aware of what's going on in the Hmong community and we see all these reports of like murder suicide and and couples altercation and just suicide in the community you know or homicide and you're you're looking at it and i think it was just not me but it was a trend that a lot of young monk folks on social media this was rampant it was it was ongoing it was happening and i was like do we even keep track of the data and so what i did was i i spent you know about a weekend just pulling up data and articles and i wanted to you know just 
remember the names of the victims, you know, uh, man or woman, and just uh, mostly, you know, the victims, not the perpetrators. And so I... So the list had men and women. I think there was a couple men and women, okay. mostly women. Okay. And, and, you know, I just wanted to remember the the their names and mm-hmm. their stories. And so, yeah, it was very depressing when I was going through it. I mean, I, I, I probably pulled up like 51 names and there was probably like over 200 cases. Yeah. And uh, it's been rapping since 1989, since we were here. And that's in just, the, these the are 80s. just ones that are documented. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and it's, it's, it's like you said, it plays into poverty. It plays into being first gen Americans, uh, especially in that 1989 case, right? That happens really close to here. It was in Stockton, California. Okay. And Voucha and her husband, they were recent immigrants. This is August 18th, August 18th, 1989. And it says nine Laotian children orphaned by the murder suicide of their parents following a tense six and a half hour hostage drama. Um, and so it says here, Bao Cha, mother of the children, ages 1 to 13, was fatally shot Thursday evening by her husband, um, who then put the handgun to his own head as eight of their nine children huddled in another room in the apartment. Um, the ninth child, a 12-year-old boy, fled from the apartment earlier through a window and alerted police that his father was inside with a handgun, threatening his mother and playing Russian roulette with the other children. None of the children were injured. Um, wow. Yeah, I mean, the article goes on, and I'm sure we can link it somewhere if, if people are interested in reading more about it. But wow, that's scary. Well, I think it's the cause of what the police said, too. They said that he was just receiving release from probation. Oh, wow. And they said that he had blamed his wife for a probation violation arrest. And so I think... So he was... He had probably been beating her to some degree. Yes, Is that domestic so violence. That's why, part of domestic yeah. violence. And she had called to arrest him. Cases like this, re- like these types of instances are why a lot of the early Hmong nonprofits started like here in yeah. Sacramento Hmong Women Heritage, Heritage isn't around protect, anymore yeah Hmong Women Heritage was but really big this is why they Hmong started women. was to help women who were in domestic violent relationships and they couldn't find anywhere to help them yeah, yeah. and I think just having that support group to help them was very very essential because you're a refugee you're new you're due to a new country and you are I mean same maybe you married a horrible guy and he's just very controlling very possessive and i think it has to do with education i think what you said was and what was that term and meshment or over enmeshment over enmeshment right where men thinks that women are their possession and i think it's a wrong interpretation of mong culture you know and i think it's oh i pay the bride price for you so you're my you're my possession you're mine the crazy uh, thing, though, is that it's not just a Hmong thing, right? It's not. The because Chinese I, have a bad price, Like, too. lots of cultural, <laughs> culture. like, traditional beliefs uh, because but of those types the, of marriage contracts, and yes. they end up interpreting women as their property. Yes. I think in the Hmong community, I think it's that interpretation that has become the norm of saying... Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. I paid a bride price for you. You're mine. And I think we have to redefine that term. I mean, that's why there's so many conversations about ending the patriarchy because that's what the patriarchy is. is. Yeah, and and I think it's just either we reinterpret that term of what is the bride price? Is it cultural? Is it what's so significant to a woman? Uh, do we use Western you know, perspective looking at it? Eastern well, why even call it a bride price? I mean, technically it shouldn't be called a bride price because it's it's a type of... It's a form of like it's a gift necessary. Mm-hmm. Like it's not necessarily a price on the head. Well, I think it's see, and and and, and I think that comes from experience too. Because I've I talked to a lot of women, and like for me, from personal experiences, the the bride price or the so my, my, that my parents charge, they gave it back to my sisters. Well, yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, the thing. Is yeah. it's just supposed to be a ceremonial thing where yeah. it's like, okay, sure, this is the price that we need to but give know, the family for taking your daughter away, and then when you give that price to the family, they're supposed the family is supposed to return all of that in the form of gifts. gifts so to it's the daughter, yeah, yeah. There's a ceremonial but, purpose to it that gets lost because then people just interpret it as, oh, I'm buying the woman. Yeah, but it's a in, price. In some 
in some families I know is the parents might be greedy and they, they well, keep Well, it's true. That's and, that's and not, that's, yeah. I mean, like then some families don't see already, it that way. Yeah, and it's already so broken it, or the relationship of the marriage. It comes down already, to yeah. family relationships yeah. as well. If you are living in a, in a home where, you know, it's abusive mm -hmm. and it's not healthy, like it's toxic, then... And so how do we? These even are the types of <laughs> outlooks that we get. How do we even begin to address this with you? <laughs> well, but I just, yeah, yeah. But well, it, let's it, like let's talk uh -huh. about a, few, a bit about like more cases. Yes. There's like more than one. Well, so uh, there's one. In um, so there's the family murder suicide that actually took place here in North Sacramento recently, right? Yeah, and I think my. Um, well, this one is from 1999. Oh. And so this actually took yes. place just a few blocks from where we are right now. Yeah. Uh, um, at the Hope Center. Yes. Um, and it says here um, that her name was Mai Tao. She returned Sunday to the one bedroom apartment where her and her husband, where her husband, where her and her husband and family mm -hmm. lived. Um, and her husband had killed five of their seven children and himself in less than 24 hours. Um, and so. Um, yeah, and, and like if she didn't leave the home and she was She there, had left the home. Yes. And so it says here uh, the older brothers had escaped. One was 14 mm -hmm. and one was nine. And they escaped through a bathroom window again, which sounds very similar to the last case. Um, and they, they were able to survive because then their father ended up killing the rest of their siblings who were not able to escape. Yeah, and it's just so heartbreaking with these murder suicide. In 2016, um, the title reads, He kissed his wife, then stabbed her 101 times. Wow. Um, so distraught that his wife had a rich boyfriend, um, this person kissed her on her cheek and lips and then stabbed her to death inside the couple's East Fresno home in March of 2016. She was stabbed 101 times in their bedroom while their crying three-year-old son watched. I mean, I think all this is just really violent. Um, and I feel a little uneasy reading mm -hmm. it and talking about it. But, I mean, this is the harsh reality um, of, like, what happens um, in these types of instances. Um, and we've already kind of touched upon the, uh, upon some of the issues that it brings up, like, Cultural issues, cultural like how right. we view women, just looking at the bride price, right? Um, mental health issues for men, like this idea of, you know, seeing women a certain way and then seeing them as your possession and then interpreting that over enmeshing, over that over enmeshment yes. and taking on all of these additional stressors that turn you into just a violent, angry person. Um, and and I then, think, yeah, I think these discussions can be discussed like, what is how does our culture, traditional culture, played a role in the thinking of men and how are, how do Hmong men adjust to American society? I don't think that... Well, I what do think, you think? You're a Hmong man. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to know. <laughs> I, have my, I have my thoughts I can share, but I would I like think, to I think, I think for me it's a little different because, you know, I think for me... I, I, well, it's not a little different, but from my interpretation is I think a lot of Hmong men resort to this because it's it's the it's our belief, our cultural belief. I mean, it's not mine in particular, but knowing the Hmong community is if I can't win an argument with you in this lifetime, well, we're going to go to heaven and we're sorted out there. And so what I'm going to do. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> There's, always that, There's always that saying. There's always that saying. I've never heard of that before. There's always that saying that ying ying chao hong do ying jiku um chao shao ya ying um bali mu hai na or something like that. And 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 who are you going to go talk to about it? I'm sorry. Yeah, chao. <laughs> yeah, that's why. And you, know? you think you're going to win the, out there? I'm for sorry. the really really older generation, they're like that. For that's the younger crazy. ones, for the younger ones, it might be you know uh, for like those who are in the. 30s and yeah. under it might be like jealousy okay. crime of passion passion crime of passion and love uh -huh. but i think for the really really older ones it's really i i can't get in their head like i know it's probably the stress of being first gen as adjusting to american society it's really so tough. so you know the research does talk about stressors like yes. economic stressors yes. and poverty and and you know like the the 1999 case right they live in one bedroom apartment with nine kids one bedroom apartment with nine kids and That's he hard. works at a golf course and the rent's 393 a month 
I mean, just I mean, imagine just... for for our listeners, like, you know, if you grew up in a cramped household, that was stressful. Yeah. Um. So imagine. I mean, everybody that. lived in the projects. Like, like if you still remember, like those apartments. Like everybody remembers, and this is like the perfect scene for everyone. Like we might we not might not live together, but mm-hmm. you remember always as a kid visiting like apartments where there's a lot of Hmong people. Mm-hmm. Kids would be playing marbles outside. Jump right. ro- Chinese jump rolls. Right. Yeah. Um, there would be like somebody in that apartment complex that makes papaya that you could go buy, and that's the norm. And, and we that that was our childhood, sure. you know. But then you realize, wait, we we're all that was not a norm. That was a normal childhood for us, but it was not a normal kid's childhood like in American standard. We all grew up in poverty, and you know we never talk about the stressors of what our parents went through. And I think you know a lot of them, some of them knew how to handle it, and then mm-hmm. a, a majority of us. They probably not. Oh, it's hard. Yeah. And, you know, back to being, and say how Hmong men sees this, is it's probably just, what? who do you talk to during that time? Well, I think, you know, I think, like, speaking from a cultural societal aspect, because I, I study culture in society, there are, um, there are certain aspirations, like, in each culture that people work towards, right? Like, in American culture, we have... We do have rituals we go through. People don't talk about it that way, but like graduate, like going to school is something everyone does. Like graduating and walking that stage for high school is a ceremony that we all go through. And, um, you know, and then going to college and getting a job, like um, maybe now even traveling is a part of these like cultural norms that everyone does. These are the things in society that people work towards, that people like you know, dream of, like, these are their hopes and dreams, right? And these are the stories that a society creates. And so those are the things that we value as, as first, second generation Americans. And these are the cultural ceremonies that we go through as Americans. We might not see it that way, but if you switch it and apply it to like the Hmong culture, well, you know, what did our, what did our grandparents and parents valued? They valued, you know, getting married, starting mm-hmm. a family. Um, and so when Still you... Still very Hmong, right? They, they so love, like, exactly. For, like we yeah. have different set of expectations that and dreams that we work towards. And so when you take people who kind of have this very, um, like very specific set of values and then you just place them in a new place where they don't speak English, they don't like, they don't connect, they don't drive, they can't, they can't, uh, really interact with the society here and they can't they can't they can't properly adapt because they don't have the capabilities to like if you don't speak english you don't drive like you don't feel comfortable and the resources is never there yeah well yeah Yeah, i mean like you you i mean they're giving they're given piecemeal resources but you know but even culturally speaking like i can take my grandma to a concert and she's gonna be like what is this and where am i (laughs) like so i mean i just think Remember when you, you took the Hmong elders at the Hope Center to the the Go to One Center? And like, the, how was that experience? Well, yeah. I mean, that's something they really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And so and so they just, but that's the thing is we went to go see the WWE match and it was really exciting because they, they watch like wrestling. Uh-huh. So that's exciting for them. But I'm just saying like when you don't, sort of have these things to work towards, then what else are you going to work towards? Like, you know, you have to tuning and you don't really have these other things to do or like dream of, then you are focused on what you might have dreamed of when you were younger, which was like, oh, or, yeah. oh, like, like, that's really, because what do we value? We value starting a family. And, and that's, that's, a, that's the thing I see now from like a, a male perspective. I, I see a lot of men in their 40s and 50s reliving their teens. Well, exactly. And because, some of them did, like, didn't, didn't have get a teen. To. They didn't yeah. have a teenage life. They, they grew were up in refugee soldiers, soldiers like, and grew up in refugee camps, and they so never had a childhood. Yeah, it's hard, you know. Folks who are born in the sixties grew up in a war torn era because from the sixties to seventy five, mm-hmm. and from sixty to seventy five, if you grew up in that area, you grew era or that decade. Yeah. you grew up watching. Uh, airplanes dropping bombs to villages. At night, you would see uh, guns firing across the mountains to Pumbia and Longjing. Uh, you would, you know, uh, you would go to school, but it wouldn't really be school because, like, 
you know, vibes were always changing, you know. Yeah. Once the summer comes along, then, you know, the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese forces takes offensive. Once the summer subsided, subsided then the American bombers and the SGU's folks pushed in, and then uh, the grounds were always changing, nothing was stabilized, and then, bam, you hit 75, right? Mm-hmm. 75 when they kicked down, right? Or we, we lost the country, or they say, it, or, you know, we escaped because the, uh, the communists took over. And we became people of the jungle. Like, mm. we left our villages to right. literally live in a jungle. Sure. And from 75 up until 82, most likely, we were in the jungles walking barefooted to La- to Thailand. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had to navigate through that. And so I think a lot of them didn't get to live their childhood or live their lives until they got to the refugee camp, which they experienced that a little bit. You know, Mutalango lived that. And then they would get married, you know, mm-hmm. already. 14, mm-hmm. 15, 16, 17, 18, and get married. Come to the U.S., bam, you get hit with. Um, it sounds like I'm making an excuse, but I'm just. <laughs> but you get hit well, with, like. I think you're like, trying to offer an explanation. Yeah, yeah, you get hit with, like, okay, I am here in the U.S. now, and I'm supposed to take care of my family. But I live in a one-bedroom apartment. I live in the projects, and there's mm-hmm. no jobs out there. And. Mm-hmm. I don't understand anything about American culture. I don't know capitalism. I don't know. You're at the bottom of the society. I am the bottom of society. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody, everybody looks down on us. Yeah. Or then we experience racism. Yeah. And then we keep really quiet because we don't know where to voice our. So you get bullied. Yeah, you get bullied, and then you get reinterpreted that oh, their community is fine because when you ask them if they're okay, they're okay. But then, what else are you, what are you guys to, to say? say? Yeah, there's I'm murder good. suicide, but it's like the 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 the, the details of that murder suicide, uh, poverty, all that's there, but it's not being published in the media. Maybe we should do more research and reevaluate all these experiences to reinterpret how we should look at these cases. I think you know what I'm talking about is generational trauma and how men address this. Is. Like this is not all Hmong men are bad, and not all Hmong men are good. I mean, there's yeah, like. These that perform these acts are, I would consider them bad and men who don't know how to address their mental health or personal issues and and let them doing what they do, you know, and that's all men are like that. You know, there's good and bad, but, you know, I think it's us understanding generational or how men address their own generational trauma because, a lot of Hmong men has a lot of generational trauma. The older ones, especially, you know, s- sometimes you can't even talk to an older about their past, you know. Yeah. And they, they hold it in, and it just might be the culture of not sharing your experiences. But then you realize, okay, it's pretty toxic, you know, to not have them talk about it because how do you heal from trauma? You heal from trauma by speaking on it, right? Right. And by, by speaking your peace and making peace with what happened. Well, I think a lot of them don't make peace for what happened. And... You know, then it can affect it people can affect that people. need them to do yeah. things like this. And then you have a general population that's already don't know how to interpret their feelings or control their mental health. Then, you know, it leads to tra- these tragic events. Yeah, and I was kind of talking about, you know, men sort of trying, and not just men, but maybe like this older generation trying to find their place within a new society, this cultural division that they feel that adds to the stresses on themselves and then can add to like family stressors because the health of the family really depends on the health of the parents, like the mental health of the parents, yes. the mental health of the father. The nucleus um, of the family, right? Yeah, right, right. and I mean, these are the reasons why these are the issues that lead to cases like murder-suicide cases because you're having so many of these issues that stem from your mental health from, you know, then like unhealthy relationships that you are building, um, toxic relationships that stem from toxic masculinity. Um, And these are just some of the things that I can imagine would lead people to feel so stressed out that they would commit an anomic suicide, Um, which is, you know, like just feeling so out of control or like, not being able to respond to sudden changes like cheating and infidelity, yes. for example, um, 
or like not having enough money or just having like overload of stress that you decide to kill yourself and your family. In 2020, which was the year that the pandemic started, um, the UN reports that 47,000 girls and women were murdered by their partners or a family member. So if you break that down and do the math, that's one girl every 11 minutes is killed. Wow, that is shocking. This that's such a, it's, it's tragic. That's that's you know, and this is per- perpetrated by men. It doesn't necessarily oh. say, but just based off of the statistics we have been going off of, that may be highly likely. Because I think it was eighty eight percent. No, eighty eight percent is used, but ninety one percent are perpetrated by men. There's no rule to yeah. how murder suicide happens, but we're just kind of providing some. Insights. Some of our, yeah, some, some of our, yeah, insights. like because we don't talk about this in our community at all. Like, who talks about murder suicide? Who talks about how men feels about this case? They would just say like, "Oh, not all men are like that," and mm-hmm. I, I, I treat my woman with dignity and I love her. But it's like, but how do you even bring it up so that these discussions becomes meaningful or a teachable environment to the younger generations to not repeat? You know, we don't have that. And I mean, there we do not talk about it, but then at the same time, I feel like when these cases happen, everyone talks That's about, about it. it. And it's not necessarily in the most, like in the best way, yes. maybe. Um, because, you know, with one of the previous cases we mentioned, um, it was on Facebook and people were responding and there were just all sorts of responses. Yes. And now that the case is gone, it's silence. Like we don't see any movement to prevent this in the future we don't see any there's no traction and are we just going to wait for the next case the next case the next case to document it i i feel like as a community we need to rally around something to make change in the community you know and and by that i think it's just we need to discuss it more in the classrooms and the community engagement uh you know podcasts um just highlight statistics in our community and say like hey you know it is pretty shocking and maybe this shock factor will change how we well maybe it will encourage huh. people to get help yeah. um i i think that getting therapy is still highly stigmatized yes. like i don't i don't i wouldn't condemn someone for getting therapy but even for me like i don't see it as a bad thing and yet it still took me so long to go see a therapist (laughs) like i mean i don't think i'm not ashamed of that you know and no one should be ashamed of that but even myself i'm like no i don't need to see one like i don't necessarily feel bad but it's still like out of the ordinary to say i'm gonna go see a therapist today and i think it's just like how people don't want to see doctors. Like mm-hmm. you have to twist your arm or like you, something has to happen for you to see a doctor. And, uh, you know, we we have to move beyond that and just, hey, maybe I'll I'll just see a therapist because I don't know. Yeah. Maybe and, it'll and help. I encourage, I encourage and if it everyone, doesn't, that's okay. I encourage everyone to seek professional help. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's help as in like friends, help True. as in family, sure. help as in like your your that's a different kind of help. Yeah. And then there's help as in professional help who mm-hmm. can really help you sort out your mind, your thoughts. Like a professional who understands these types of experiences, experiences and issues. Could, could explain to you that, hey, this is what you're going through and this is how you, you should can address, address it, it, look at it. Like yeah. these are exercises mm-hmm. you might be able to do or, you know, um, and These are strategies that you can think of to help yourself yeah, feel and, and calmer or and better. And never think you're alone out there because, you know, I think a lot of times it's a lot of folks in the, our community, especially in the Hmong community, they're like, oh, I feel so alone because nobody talks about it or nobody's involved and in you this. And you, to, you, well, you don't have to tell anyone yeah, you're seeing a therapist. You, know, yeah. <laughs> you can just silently do it and yep. feel better, mm-hmm. you know. And so uh, resources, you know, I think we're going to share some resources for our viewers out there yeah. in case, you know, you need to seek help. We encourage you to seek help. There's a national Suicide prevention hotline at one eight hundred two seven three talk or which is uh one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. Locally in Sacramento, you know, we have great organizations like Weaves whose mission is to promote safe and healthy relationships to support survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, sex trafficking. Uh, their number is nine one six nine two zero two nine five two. 
another great organization is my sister's house. Mm -hmm. uh, it's to serve API and other underserved women and children impacted by domestic violence, sexual assault, and uh, you know, providing a culturally appropriate response. Uh, their number is at 916-930-0626. And these are great organizations that we have here in Sacramento and our local area that can support you know, uh, women, uh, folks with domestic violence or, you know, with suicide thoughts and, you know, seek professional help. Just go talk to your primary care doctor. They can refer you out to a uh, therapist, psychiatrist to help you sort out your thoughts. And, you know, if you feel that somebody in the Hmong community can help you sort out your feelings too, go talk to them. But make sure it's someone you trust and make sure it's not, they're not enablers. You, when you talk to people when, and people tell you to do certain things, then you got to realize maybe that person's not the person you should be talking to, you know, because you should only talk to people who helps you sort out your thoughts and help you come to a certain conclusion by yourself. But if they're encouraging you to do something that's irrational or something that's, you know, uh, it's just not, not right you yet, then you shouldn't do it. In the past in Sacramento, we had this great organization called Hmong Women Heritage. It's no longer here, but we have other organizations here that also provide support. So I encourage all of our viewers and everybody who's tuning in today to seek help. If, you know, domestic violence, suicide, uh, any mental health issues that you have and you seek that you need help, then I think this is something that, because these cases are tragic. If you read through these cases that Pachina and I talked about, and you guys can also visit my Hope Center post and just read the certain cases that I summarize. It's, it's very tragic, very draining, and it takes a lot of energy. Yeah, or even, you know, speak up, because sometimes we, we see these things happening um, and we don't really say anything. It's hard to to step out of that uh, yeah, it's bubble. Because sometimes we normalize these things in our lives. Yeah, I think a lot of thing, like things in the Hmong community is we normalize a lot of things that happen to us as saying like, oh, I've suffered worse or this happens all the time and I'm okay with it. Well, you shouldn't be okay with it. You shouldn't always seek to be, seek to have the best options for yourself. Anything that happens to you is not normal. And, and you know, I think in the Hmong community, sometimes we need to be selfish. We're not selfish enough in the Hmong community to take what we want or or say what we need with. We, we become complicit, like you said. It's like, oh, this happens to us because the Hmong community gets treated like this all the time. Well, this happened to me because I grew up and nothing good's ever happened to me. Like, we have this defeatist attitude. But we can always change, change the narrative. That. We can always, we can change, always the narrative. change the narrative. Yeah, yeah, narratives can always be rewritten. Laws, policies can always be advocated to change. Resources can always be rededicated to change a community, you know? And I think people do want help. Yes. You know? I think people and do so want help. I don't think we should shy away from that. Yes. And I think, you know, a lot of folks are creating new organizations. I think I forgot to mention Chan Boff, right? That's one organization yeah, that's great org. uh, talking about issues in the Hmong community and bringing all these new issues to light. And communities in Minnesota and Wisconsin, when I was doing my research, they have like violence-free Minnesota and domestic abuse Wisconsin. And uh, we'll link the reports for you guys, but they actually document domestic violence or suicide reports of women online and they track all the cases i i couldn't find any for california and it might be because of california law which protects women's rights but in minnesota you know you see all these cases and that's where i pulled out all my cases from minnesota and wisconsin but in california you know it was really hard like i had to go through news article and look at it one at a time and maybe there's something that you know our community in California, we could look at like, hey, why don't we start documenting these cases? And by profiling and reading, then sometimes you find information that can help you address mental health issues, okay. uh, address toxic masculinity, see what men and women are thinking that leads us and, you know, to prevent this sort of tragedy in the future. So I hope this episode inspires you to look more into community health. Um, and we're glad you joined us. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Mongish is a podcast produced by Hmong American Media, located in Sacramento, California, sponsored by Hmong Organization for Progress and Empowerment Center, known as the Hope Center, along with Culture to Cloth. And we hope you guys join us for our next episode. <laughs> <laughs>